Welcome to Pirate TV. So today we're talking with Helen Yaffe in Glasgow, Scotland. Dr. Helen Yaffe is a senior lecturer in economics and social history at the University of Glasgow and a visiting fellow at the Latin America and Caribbean Center in London School of Economics. Since 1995, she has spent time living and researching in Cuba and participating in solidarity campaigns. How are you doing, Helen? Hi, thanks for inviting me. Great. So um, you're a documentary producer and uh, you produce two now. And uh, the first one, which we ran on Pirate TV, is Cuba and COVID. And then uh, while I was going through the rigmarole of trying to get permission to show that on Pirate TV, you had already left for Cuba and you were making your next one, which is Cuba's life task, combating climate change. We're going to show that today. So um, you also have written three books. And um, I just wanted to thank you for letting us share your documentaries with the people. No, it's great. I mean, we want to disseminate the documentary as far and wide as possible. I think that there is actually a lot, a great deal that the world can learn from Cuba's approach to these big global issues. And uh, it's great that you're screening it. So thank you. Uh, this documentary is 80% in Spanish and uh, Free Speech TV has a habit of running their trailer along the bottom of the screen, you know, for their fundraising which covers up the closed captioning. So I'm just gonna overdub uh, part there. So uh, you don't mind that, do you? No, you go ahead. Okay, well, let's take a look at it then. Everything we produce and consume comes from nature. And nature sets limits on how much we can exploit it. Scientists are warning us about climate change and its effects are already being suffered around the world. We must change the way we treat this planet before we run out of time. I have been visiting Cuba for more than 25 years, learning about their alternative development. In Cuba, the state plans and controls production and distribution. This has played a crucial role in society's interaction with the environment. As a developing country, Cuba faces many challenges. Although Cuba's share of world CO2 emissions is less than 0.1%, its population of 11 million is disproportionately threatened by climate change. I have come to Havana to find out how vulnerable Cuba is to climate change and what is being done about it. In Cuba, the most common natural disasters are those associated with hydrometeorological phenomena, mainly tropical cyclones that affect the country between June and November. Associated with tropical cyclones is the phenomena known as upwelling, the rise in sea levels caused by wind leading to coastal flooding. We see the air pollution, climate change, the disappearance of forests due to deforestation, water scarcity. You know, there's like a lot of these environmental problems that are leading our planet to a point of no uh, return. In January 2019, an F4 tornado hit the country's capital, affecting five densely populated and industrialized municipalities. In Cuba, average temperatures have increased by more than one degree Celsius. Rainfall has significantly declined, and the variation in temperature during the day has decreased several degrees. Extensive cyclical droughts have impacted our country. For example, the drought from 2003 to 2005 was very intense, affecting almost the entire country. 
Water had to be taken by train to much of the population. Today in Cuba, the country's climate is undergoing a complete transition from the human tropical climate towards a subhumid climate in, in which the patterns of rain, availability of water, soil conditions, and temperatures will be different. The climate will be much hotter and more arid, and that will negatively impact the environment. Today, the rise in sea level today affects our coasts, and that impact will increase. We will lose coastland. Many towns and populations, more than a million inhabitants, that will have to be moved towards higher areas. It really scares me. I, uh, a few days ago, I talked with my sister, and I almost cried because I was like, oh my God, this is something that it's going to happen really soon. We face a terrible situation. Many islands are going to disappear. What can we do to prepare for the damaging effects of climate change? Finding solutions is now essential. Cuba has come up with a 100-year plan to protect its population and environment, known as Terrea Vida. It's a plan of actions carried out by the state administration and institutions for the adaptation and mitigation of climate change, in line with the country's needs and in compliance with international conventions and the Paris Agreement. It is coordinated by the Ministry of Science, Technology and Environment, CITMA, which has a supervisory role and is led by the Minister, Elba Rosa Montoya. In addition, serious attention is paid to this issue at the highest level of government. Taria Vida is the policy response to Cuba's scientific information on climate change. Since 2014, every year, the most recent scientific information has been provided to the government, especially on rising sea levels. As a large island and archipelago, but with a main island, for Cuba everything concerning the coast is key. In December 2016, the president requested that the scientific information be transferred to a policy platform with enforceable measures to solve or alleviate climate-related problems. For Cuba, the state plan is unique, and I don't think there are many others like it in the world. All Cuban state institutions must respond with plans of action in the short, medium, and long term, and the very long term. Changes in environmental phenomena are not yet perceived within one or two years. So we have four or five year periods to evaluate the effects of the climate change on our country. Taria Vida is a very short document, a kind of umbrella plan, that is expanded in the provinces and then goes to the municipalities. Today, the greatest responsibility is within the municipalities, as the process of governance in Cuba is being decentralized. The municipalities are acquiring a greater role, and the decisions must be taken at that level. At regular intervals, the president and vice ministers meet Cuban scientists to review programs and projects of national priority. For example, there is one concerning agriculture, another water. Through Taria Vida, the theme of climate change is under constant review. The president gets regular updates on the state plan, which is Taria Vida. Taria Vida is monitored by institutions. Without judging anyone, we have seen great climate change plans produced to comply with international commitments. They are published, printed, and then filed. In Cuba, Taria Vida is a living process, a product of the system that generated it. These actions involve all sectors of Cuban society. In fact, the main actors are the communities. 
and the people who develop economically, socially, and politically through them. Nothing is disconnected from this state plan. For this reason, each one of its five strategic areas and 11 tasks involves not only scientific institutions but also administrative, research, educational, and cultural institutions. Every sector of Cuban society is involved in these actions. From the outset, the priority was human life, which meant prioritizing the most threatened human settlements in the coastal areas. Another key priority is food security, so agriculture is the focus of Terria Vida. And then we went to the beaches and tourism, given that tourism is a Cuba's main source of foreign exchange income, a means to secure resources for other tasks. For example, task three concerns beaches. Task five concerns reforestation, especially mangroves and coastal vegetation. Task six concerns corals. Essentially, Terria Via seeks climate solutions through natural solutions. Reinforcing the environmental agenda with the climate agenda. The coasts are vulnerable, partly due to the destruction of coral reefs and coastal vegetation with damage to the coastline. When this is restored, you have a win-win solution that improves coastal resilience and improves the country's biodiversity. Land ownership and control over agriculture and extractive industries are key for implementing environmental policy. After the Cuban Revolution of 1959, large land holdings were nationalised and converted into state farms or redistributed to small farmers and cooperatives. A series of environmental laws were also introduced. In our country since 1959, uh, with the triumph of the Cuban Revolution, uh, the conservation of nature became a political will. In 1976, the Constitution of the Republic of Cuba was approved and it provided in its Article 27 uh, the duty of the state and the society to or care about the environment. Today, it is called state plan, but for many years, special attention was paid to environmental issues and climate change. In fact, since Rio de Janeiro, Earth Summit in 1992, the words of our Commander-in-Chief Fidel Castro provide evidence of the actions and concerns for human beings. An important biological species is at risk of disappearing due to the rapid and progressive elimination of its natural habitat, mankind. It must be said that consumer societies are chiefly responsible for this appalling environmental destruction. They have poisoned the seas and rivers. They have polluted the air. The forests are disappearing, the deserts are expanding. Third world countries cannot be blamed for all of this. Yesterday's colonies and today's nations exploited and plundered by an unjust and international economic order. The solution cannot be to prevent the development of those who need it the most. In reality, everything that contributes to the underdevelopment and poverty today is a flagrant violation of the environment. If we want to save humanity from its self-destruction, wealth and available technologies must be distributed better throughout the planet. Stop transferring to the third world lifestyles and consumer habits that ruin the environment. Pay the ecological debt, not the foreign debt. 
eradicate hunger and not humanity. Tomorrow will be too late to do what we should have done a long time ago. Thank you. The main value of the speech was to put environmental problems in their socio-economic context. The environmental issue has been detached from its origins in capitalist development from the foundations of a system that based on excessive consumption, on unequal production and consumption patterns, created the present situation. Fidel's analysis, uh, Marxist analysis, presents the historical context of the socio-economic relationships. That is the great value of his speech. It had important repercussions for Cuba, which modified the constitution of the republic that same year in 1992. And that constitutional reform introduced the concept of sustainable development. Another huge step in this environmental process uh, was the creation of the Ministry of Science, Technology and Environment. I mean, the conservation and protection of nature in our country received like a huge, a huge uh, boost with the creation of this uh, body. On the return trip from Rio, they talked about the need for an agency in Cuba to address environmental issues. And that was how, in the middle of the special period of economic crisis, the Ministry of Science, Technology, and the Environment was created. Fidel, in the worst economic situation during the years of the special period, committed to reinforcing the country's environmental agenda. Another huge step in this environmental process was the creation of the Environmental Law 81. Currently, this is the main law in our country that regulates everything related to the Cuban environmental protection and you know, establishes the main standards and principles to control and direct and executing the environmental policy in, in Cuba. It puts boundaries and limits to the uh, activities of the transnational. The constitution in force is the constitution of 2019, uh, recently approved. This repealed the previous constitution and this constitution in its article 75 establishes the right to enjoy a healthy and balanced uh, environment as a human right. This Tarea Vida definitely is another important um, action in our country because it's the Cuban um, state plan to confront climate change. Cuba has a system of civil protection established since the early 1960s following Hurricane Flora, 1963, which caused major losses of human and animal lives and economic damage. It is organized so that the moment there is a threat, that phenomena comes under permanent vigilance and various stages are established with mechanisms for protection and evacuation. Cuban civil defense adopts a system approach. The function is to protect the population, their resources, the economy, and the environment against natural, technological, and sanitary threats. Not just disasters, but also war or the consequences of climate change. We are located in the world's fourth region for hurricane formation a very active region meteorologically. The hurricane season begins on 1 June and ends on 30 November. We have established operational and technical procedures for early warning of the impact of extreme meteorological events. We have surveillance zones and maximum alert zones where we monitor the approach of an event and its impact. The National Defense Council coordinates this system. It is reproduced at provincial, municipal, and neighborhood levels throughout the country. At the local level, risk study centers focus on 
centros de estudio de los riesgos que se ponen en función de specific phenomena and the neighborhood is organized. The social organizations in each area take preventative measures. Local governments set up local defense councils, which organize how the system works, distribute basic food stuff so that people don't go without, check electrical installations and the evacuation plan. Evacuation can be self-evacuation, people who move to safer places, with neighbors, friends, or relatives, or those evacuated to state institutions because their homes are in poor condition. The political organizations and organizations of the masses made up of the population and parts of the civil defense system. When there is a situation or event, they join the health brigades activated in the popular councils in the defense zones. They support the line worker specialists who established the vital systems related to energy. The neighborhood cleanup. After damage occurred during the event, including the building structures, they contribute to local efforts. This guarantees several things. First, that there is protection at the neighborhood level. And second, that there is complete knowledge because those neighbors know where the most vulnerable people and the most unprotected buildings are. That secures the process. We have a cycle for disaster risk reduction, prevention, preparation, and response, and recovery. The recovery has two periods, rehabilitation of the vital systems and reconstruction. Every year in May before the hurricane season begins, we have an annual exercise, meteorol, in which the population practice for disaster situations. Initially, it was focused on tropical cyclones and hurricanes, but it's been broadened to prepare the population for droughts and earthquakes. The perception of risk is quite high. When we analyze any deaths that happen, they are almost always due to negligence. When there is a climate-related problem, straight away the civil defense and government come and take care of people and evacuate them. The Red Cross, civil defense, and even the military. Everyone including the neighbors themselves. Recently, we had a meeting about climate change in Cuba and Puerto Rico. And we saw that the number of people who died from Hurricane Irma was 10 in Cuba and 3,000 in Puerto Rico. People die here from meteorological events too, but loss of life is minimal. Whenever someone dies, a thorough investigation is carried out by the state institutions about the cause of death, and in many cases, it is negligence by individuals. Do you live near here? Yes. Have you suffered damage in your own home? Fortunately, I have taken my things out and put them upstairs. Did the water enter your house? Yes. Up to the foot of the house. Up to here? No, up to here. But if you keep going up there, those houses have been flooded, and they have lost mattresses. I was told some houses over there were destroyed. Yes, there and that long stretch. The sea is there behind those houses. So we can walk up there? Yes, there is a low area over there. But measures are always taken to help. Are the people evacuated? Yes, of course, immediately, by the civil defense. In our analysis at the Ministry of Science, Technology, and the Environment, the issue of human settlements under threat is considered the most complex, because regardless of the inevitability of some measures, it is always traumatic. 
It is not about people's lack of understanding, but it is very painful because moving implies a change in their way of life, of culture and traditions. Can I ask you a question? They told us that this area of Santa Fe is low-lying and the sea enters, and that these houses we see here have been abandoned. With climate change, the tides that form here in the northeast have washed away all the walls on the shoreline. And since there is no resources for repairs, it keeps eroding. Do you live here? I was born and I live here. In my house, when the sea enters, we remove the back door and the front door. We take everything upstairs and the water enters through the back door and leaves through the front door, as if we were a ship at sea. The water has reached the secondary school nearly six blocks from here. There are always consultations in Cuba. Of course, not everyone agrees. It is not compulsory. There is no repression for those who do not go. But really, they must evaluate the opportunity that the Cuban state gives them to live in another place nearby. People who live from the sea, who were born by the sea, never want to turn their backs on the sea. The problem is that 99% of the people who live by the sea do not want to leave. My house was originally wooden and two-story. The first time the sea entered, it took the upper part of the house, and all that was left in the lower part was the front and back walls. We were told that it was uninhabitable, but we rebuilt it. We knocked down the top and started to build, but we stopped because the materials were very expensive. You don't want to move from here? No, we're not leaving here. This house can be reduced to one block. I'm not moving. I will go under that boat and sleep. Are you a fisherman? We are all fishermen. Those who live by the sea, fish. Those who live in the countryside live off the land. The time will come when people in those houses will not be able to stay because they will be flooded. I would not like to leave here because I love this place. God willing, I don't ever have to move. I like it here, the neighborhood, friends, and everything, and it's what I'm used to. Yes, but look how many abandoned houses there are around you. Isn't it likely that you will also have to abandon it too? Yes, perhaps we will also have to leave, evacuate. At some point, due to climate change, I don't know. These areas, Santa Fe, nautical, coastal areas, are prioritized in the work of adaptation to climate change. Fishing zones where people have lived their whole lives. They live there and make use of the coast. Today, they are already damaged, and within 50 years, they will be more damaged. The whole process of relocating people who reside in high-risk vulnerable settlements is financed by the state. This is one of the complexities to speeding up this process. It is not dependent on the ability of each citizen. The state assumes that responsibility and it requires substantial resources that the state has to allocate among its many expenses. But it is a state priority to carry out these relocations. New settlement and communities have been built. New buildings in existing communities. We have also learned that it is not only a physical issue of rebuilding houses. You have to relocate the whole way of life. Rebuild a setting where people have social services, medical services, educational services, job opportunities. This is more complex when the community's work is linked to the coast, as with fishing communities. We have concluded that relocating communities is an extreme measure to be applied only when all other measures have been exhausted. 
Ultimately, living on a long, narrow island means you cannot solve problems in coastal areas through relocating the population. They must be resolved with measures on the coast. So we are prioritizing natural solutions whenever possible. This is not a mechanical question. We have to build according to the area of intervention. With the materials and most resistant architectural forms, at the lowest cost for the family. In Cuba, scientific studies of climate change have been organized since the 1990s. In 1992, the first assessment of the impact of climate change impact was carried out. We can also say that the studies of danger, vulnerability, and risk from 2007 under instruction of Army General Raul Castro were the basis for the plan to combat climate change. The macro project study with projections of climate change of rising sea levels in the period 2050 to 2100 is also the precursor to Torilla Vida. We have studies for Cuba that indicate that the average rise in sea level will be around 29 centimeters by 2050. However, we have carried out the same analysis for 66 points of the national territory, as there are differences depending on local conditions. To carry out such an analysis, taking IPCC data on global sea level rises to each location in Cuba, can only be done if you are backed up with strong science. It helps that Cuba has research institutes, universities, and scientific centers throughout the country. In these territories, there are delegations of the Ministry of Science, Technology, and the Environment. Studies of danger, vulnerability, and the risk from climate change, and local work teams. That makes the process more expeditious and faster. This year, we presented to the government an evaluation of Torilla Vida for 2017 to 2020, and we will soon present projections for 2021 through 2025. But the limited participation of social sciences is a short-term weakness. More social sciences intervention is needed. We keep the population highly informed, but we must also engage them as active participants in the decision-making. From this will emerge ideas that had not been considered at the outset. Social sciences arrived at the environmental issue a little late, worldwide, not only in Cuba. Now it is making an increasing contribution, introducing methodological references for how to work with people. That takes methodology and mentoring. We have been supporting popular environmental education, participatory action research, the design of consultations. Social sciences are playing an increasingly crucial and definitive role. The issue of knowledge management is very important for us. Scientific knowledge must be put into an accessible language for people so they can understand. Social sciences also play an important role in the dialogue between different knowledge. The scientific knowledge produced and the knowledge of people in those local spaces and communities. In our country, in Cuba, uh, from preschool uh, education, we see uh, how the education teach boys and girls to care about the nature. And we have uh, a lot of institutions and uh, community organizations that work with kids and with young people uh, in activities like planting trees and um, collecting uh, waste, collecting uh, plastic, cleaning the beaches and the rivers. 
And definitely this is something really important to teach the kids because they are the future generation. The mass media also focus on the climate problem. The Cuban Institute of Radio and Television is part of a work group for Terea Vida, so institutionally that it is covered. But improvements are needed in implementation. Understanding this complex process requires a change in mentality. Education must persuade people that we are not just facing a transitory situation, a hurricane or other extreme event, but a complete change in living conditions. We will have to feed ourselves differently, build differently, dress differently. It is very complex. We must clearly explain the impacts of climate change on health and food security. Link it to people's lives and problems so it does not seem like a theoretical, conceptual, or methodological question. In just one square meter, we receive solar radiation equivalent to the average consumption of a whole house in Cuba. At 12 o'clock, it can go above 100 degrees. See the steam. What is it? What's inside? A solar cooker. You can cook potatoes, whatever you want to make. We have a plan within Teria Vida to generate 24% of our electricity, which at the moment is produced with oil, mainly imported oil from renewable energy sources. Let's say that Teria Vida means converting to cleaner electric transport with a higher cost. Well, Cuba must invest in transport and energy anyway. So the issue is not just whether climate policy, Teria Vida, costs more, but about the possibility of doing something differently. If you have to invest in transport, look for collective, electric, more efficient transport. Make your normal investments as efficient, green and clean as possible. Not just climate investments, but any investments to be made. In every country in the world, in Europe, Africa, Asia, the Americas, everywhere in the world, there are sufficient sources of renewable energy to achieve true sustainable development. We have direct solar energy, which we can use to produce heat or electricity. We also have wind, biomass residuals, biogas. We really have much more than we need. We have enough renewable sources that we no longer have to pollute the environment. We are also counting on economic instruments so that the Teria Vida mechanisms generate resources that give a return on these activities. For example, incentives for people to introduce biogas systems on their farm or to install solar panels on their house, and the establishment of state credit for this, which provides a return on capital. Right now, we send a little bit of CO2 into the atmosphere. Although our economy is very small, we are polluting. The cars use oil, and our electricity is mainly from oil. We have a program to shift to transportation with renewable energy sources and to natural sources of energy. We can do it. What is our big problem? The worst problem is the U.S. blockade. That is why we cannot advance any faster.
Marti, Fidel, Raul, Diaz, Cannell. Long live free Cuba. It is more than 60 years of the U.S. blockade, which was greatly tightened by the Trump administration, causing a lot of damage. And Biden, despite what he said in his electoral campaign, has still done nothing to loosen these measures. The country is in a very difficult situation, as although many do not think so, the persecution is real. Remove the genocidal blockade against the Cuban people. In the blockade, in the blockade, down with the blockade. If they really want to help, as they say, then definitely end the blockade against our country. We are a people ready to fight, along with Fidel, Raul, Canel, and all the revolutionaries. We are going to defend our achievements at any price necessary. We defend peace. They must remove the murderous and criminal blockade. We deserve to work without pressure. We deserve to be free. Free in our trade, free to buy medicines, so that our social life has harmony, our lives have quality. That is what the Cuban people deserve. If they really want to help Cuba, lift the blockade, lift the sanction, it's not complicated. This people want to stand up for themselves and achieve their own development. Just this. No more aggressions, just lift the blockade. <laughs> Another key challenge for our scientists is acquiring new technologies, which exist today for many of our activities, but which Cuban scientists cannot obtain given the blockade. It often takes longer to achieve results because of this situation. You cannot purchase early warning equipment in the United States, so you get it from China, Russia, or some other latitude, with the additional costs that implies. The U.S. blockade limits our access to external financing. We cannot access multilateral development banks. We depend on the bilateral cooperation of the United Nations system. Our options are more limited than any other country. Even sources that we should be able to access are restricted by the blockade, as Cuba's partners also receive pressures from the blockade. If they need to acquire goods or articles that are from or have a components from the United States, then blockade regulations are imposed, creating very difficult conditions for international collaboration. In the case of the Green Climate Fund, which we can access, in the most recent vote on Cuba's project approved in May 2021, the United States opposed the project. Accessing the Green Climate Fund has been a step forward. The first time Cuba has accessed a private fund. There is more flexibility with funds from the European Union. What is what we could call, and I don't like the word, a constant war. To be able to access funds which are really very limited for Cuba. Over 10 years ago, the industrialized countries agreed to give 
$100 billion annually as climate finance. That commitment has not been met. They count finances twice. Count the money promised but not delivered. Count as donations money given to a country that is actually returned. They count as donations what is really a loan. International financing is totally weighted in favor of mitigation, which is a business. There is much less money for adaptation. Funding is extremely low for small island developing states, SIDS, which are among the most vulnerable groups. Financing for adaptation is mostly non-refundable. And the countries in the north want to recover investments. They avoid commitments by the state instead using market mechanisms, insurance, loans, not the mechanisms that guarantee the financial flow that is needed internationally. Yes, we need funds, not only from the Cuban state, but also the international funds to which we have limited access. We do still get some international funds, like the GEF, Global Environment Facility. We have presented several projects. A new project is starting with GEF-7, called My Coast. Cuba received $23.9 million to develop this project, with co-financing on the Cuban side and commitments from the country's ministries and institutions. We work on the three components of this project, focusing on training the educators and capacity building in communities to enable them to implement this project. With the projects My Coast and Coastal Resilience, it is important to increase capacities. So once the projects are finished, people can advance alone, and the project becomes truly sustainable. In my view, the main contribution of Teria Vida is to have taken the climate debate to all levels of society, with imperfections and limitations in understanding. Today, we are still dissatisfied with the social perception of the climate issue, but we have given it a visibility it never had before. In addition, there are concrete results. In this period, for example, 11% of the homes in the most vulnerable areas of the coastal settlements were relocated. We have recovered corals and we have coral farms. We have recovered more than 38,000 hectares of mangroves in the area south of Havana. Today, more than 30% of Cuba is forested. In 1959, when the revolution triumphed, we had 14% forest cover. So if we evaluate the figure today, there has been progress in reforestation. Is coffee also impacted by the changes in the climate? Yes, for example, this Robusta coffee was brought from Brazil in search of a more resistant plant. The coffee matures on the tree and doesn't fall down. Here in Cuba, the traditional coffee is Arabica. It is very good, but the disadvantage is that it falls from the tree. The plant is smaller. And here, that's what we look for and is this. Pruning this plant every year yields twice the amount of an Arabica coffee plant. Despite these short-term limitations, more than 1 billion peso was invested in the country's hydraulic program in actions related to Teria Vida, safe water management, improvement of the water quality, and availability in remote locations. There are several issues that have significantly improved, including the new policies we didn't have until now. Countries have different economic and social methods. For Cuba, the socialist model has been vital to Teria Vida. 
Other countries will have to analyze it in their own context. To catalyze specific capacities to implement such planning. There is a risk in trying to solve climate issues from a climate perspective, ignoring the socio-economic premises which create these problems. Structural problems must be solved. For Cuba, this has been a reality such as the issue of poverty, with which Cuba was dealing at the beginning of the revolution and eradicating extreme poverty. It is very difficult in conditions of poverty or deep economic and social inequality to advance a climate agenda. One problem today is that you cannot convert the world's energy matrix with current consumption levels from fossil fuels to renewable energies. There are not enough resources for the panels and wind turbines, nor the space for them. There are insufficient resources for all of this. If you automatically made all transportation electric tomorrow, you will continue to have the same problems of congestion, parking, highways, heavy consumption of steel and cement. There must be a change in the way of life in our aspirations. This is part of the debate about socialism, part of Che Guevara's ideas on the new man. Without forming that new human, it is very difficult to confront the climate issue. I believe that a plan like Taria Vida needs to be supported by a socialist system. It requires a vision that not directed towards profit or self-interest. It must be premised on social equality and rejecting inequality. A plan of this nature requires a different social system, and that system is socialism. Cuba goes to this COP with results that we can share. Not that we are satisfied, we still have a lot to do. But as people, as citizens, as Cubans, we can continue to share with other countries, with scientists, scientific communities, universities in all countries. We have to keep sharing. In previous COPs, Cuba has always been willing to share our results so others can evaluate them and take them as a basis to start or continue their studies, as we have also done with scientific results in many universities and research centers we collaborate with. We do not propose to give lessons to the world, but we do want to share our experiences. We have studies on the plan to confront climate change. Taria Vida, experiences we can share with other countries, as we have done with Caribbean countries. The first lesson learned is political will, something always emphasized by international organizations including the United Nations. Perhaps the three most important lessons learned are political will, communication to translate results, and training young people. From my point of view, these are the most important achievements in Cuba. My message to this climate change conference is a message of social inclusion. This COP has to reach the people we work with. People must appropriate these results, which are scientific and political results, declarations of principles. But they must enter into dialogue with people. Women, men, people with disabilities, young people, girls and boys, each one with their knowledge and social imaginaries, from where they live, their territories, spaces they share. The results of COP cannot be disconnected from the people. That is my message.
If Cuba achieves sustainable development and the rest of the world does not, we are going to die anyway. The world must move to sustainable development, not Cuba. We have to move forward together, so we would like the mentality of the rest of the world to change. To want what is truly best for the development of humanity. Taria Vida should be worldwide. It cannot be only for Cuba. We need to Vida for the whole world. So everyone tries to make the world better, not worse, as it is now. Definitely, it's something that it involves everyone and it involves uh, the society and the population and people for everywhere. So I think that's kind of like my recommendation <laughs> to them that, you know, I think we need to take action and we need to do things and we need to just uh, be active. You know, we cannot be passive in this uh, situation. We, we need to be active and we need to be active now. So, we are going to plant these over there.